So my first name is Freeman, my last name Dyson, and my title Mr. Uh, I'm a physicist, but also a writer. Yeah, it's hard to tell, of course, but, but uh, I've been interested in science, certainly from a child. I mean, I was mostly interested in numbers. I, I was calculating things at a very young age. I, I just fell in love with numbers, and then it spread from there to the rest of nature. And I became, I remember the total eclipse of the sun, which happened when I was three. And I was furious with my father because he wouldn't take us to see it. It would have meant about about a whole day's driving. And anyway, so he said, no, you can see the partial eclipse and that's it. And I thought that was terribly unfair. So, well, I never learned much science in school. That was, I think, an advantage. In the old days, I grew up in England and we spent most of the time on Latin and Greek and, and very little on science. And I think that was good because it meant we didn't get turned off. It was, science was something we did for fun and not because we had to. Yes, well, I was 15 when the war started. So for a long time, I just stayed in school, but um, then, so it, I was lucky I had only two years of the war. And uh, so I went to work for the Royal Air Force when in, I was 19, which was already just two years before it ended. So I went to the Bomber Command headquarters, and that was uh, July 43. And so I had just two years of it, the last two years, and I was working as a statistician, mostly just collecting all the information about the Air Force operations, particularly the bombing of Germany. So I had a sort of front, a front row seat view of that. Of course, it was a total shambles, the, the whole campaign. It was a great tragedy on, on, for, for both sides, and uh, but there was nothing I could do about it. Oh, of course, they talked about it incessantly. That was, was the main subject of conversation for many years. And, and uh, so people had very strong feelings about it on both sides. And people who thought it was the greatest thing they'd ever done and people who thought it was just an unpleasant job and people thought they should never have done it at all. So there were opinions of all kinds. Well, it's very hard to tell. It, it, you, 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 I mean, it, I, I grew up in England at a time when England was winning Nobel Prizes right and left. I mean, it was amazing how many Nobel Prizes England was winning in chemistry and physics and biology and all the sciences. And at that time, the teaching of science in the schools was really lousy. I mean, I, I experienced that myself. We learned almost nothing in school. Science was very unpopular. It was, I mean, science was blamed for all the horrors of World War I, just as it's blamed today for nuclear weapons. And, and quite rightly, I mean, World War I was a horrible war, and it was mostly the fault of science. So that was, in a way, a very bad time for science. But on the other hand, we were winning all these Nobel Prizes. Well, since then, of course, teaching of science in schools in England has improved tremendously. And the number of Nobel Prizes has gone down. And uh, I think that that might even be connected. I don't know. But it's, I think it's quite possible that the more science you teach kids in school, the more it turns them off. So I don't know. I mean, it, 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 you never can tell which way it'll go. Indeed, there are. Of course, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's strange in a way that we had already, we were scared of biological warfare in the 30s. I mean, there was 
Aldous Huxley wrote his novel Brave New World and started out with anthrax bombs. So we knew all about anthrax already in the 30s. And in fact, we expected that. I mean, when World War I, when World War II came along, which was when, when I was a teenager, we all expected we would have anthrax bombs and, and this kind of stuff. We thought it would be a biological war. Fortunately, it wasn't. And, and, but it's because the danger is still there. And for, for, by the, some miracle, we, did, we escaped all that. And so you never can tell what's going to happen. But uh, biology certainly could be even worse than physics and chemistry. Well, the germ warfare, of course, exists. And there have been, on a small scale, there, there have been, and of course, a few people got killed with anthrax right here in Princeton. Well, it's always a mixture. We don't know what's... Uh, I mean, th th some things go better than you expected, other things go worse. So I'm... I, I'm, I'm I think the only sensible thing is just to wait and see. And the, 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 what I'm doing if, when I'm writing books, I, I'm not doing science so much anymore. Mostly I'm just writing books for the public. And so I'm trying to just sort of describe for the public what the choices are, what they might have, have to expect in the future. And uh, so by warning people ahead of time, maybe you have an effect. I think. The fact that Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World and talked about anthrax bombs probably helped because it meant at least we people had the, the understanding before the war began that something we didn't want to get into. So I think it, it's much better to have your eyes open but on the other hand, of course, it can do harm if you tell people, look, there's all these terrible things you can do, and then some idiot may go ahead and do it. I was amazed when, when I did this work, which, which was the, the first thing I did in physics, which, which was when, when really what made me famous this this quantum electrodynamics. I mean, what I was doing was calculating what an electron decides to do in a certain situation in an experiment. And I did a huge calculation, which took pages and pages and pages of paper. And in the end, I got a number. So that's what the electron has to do. And well, then somebody in New York does the experiment, and the uh, electron somehow knows that. The electron does exactly what I calculated. But to me, that was amazing. I mean, why should the electron know? How does the electron know? And uh, but somehow it does. Anyway, to me, that sounds like a miracle. That's very hard. I really need equations and a blackboard to do that. I mean, it's, it's very technical stuff. I mean, essentially, I was a mathematician, and so my job was just cleaning up the mathematics. Or well, the physics already had been done. That's to say, the ideas were already there. And all I had to do was just organize calculations so that's about all I can say. I, I, I can't t tell you the details. But uh, so I came, I, had a, I, I arrived as a young student, and all the work had really already been done to understand atoms and, and light and, and, and radio waves and, and all, all the components were in a way understood, but nobody understood how to organize the calculations. So that was my job. Yes, well, I can tell you roughly what happened. I mean that the atoms, by and large, were understood in the 1920s 
when quantum mechanics was invented. And the, the quantum mechanics is the part of science which tells how atoms actually behave. And so that was all more or less worked out in the 1920s. But there were some fine details left over. And particularly, there was an experiment which was done in America at Columbia University in the 1946, just after the war, which disagreed with the quantum mechanics. And so it was cl clear we had a, a real discrepancy. Theory said one thing and the experiment said something different. So that w w was the stimulus that started me going, that uh, there was something there to be explained which wasn't understood and to, to try to see why that experiment gave the answer it did. So th th it was a big opportunity for a young student starting to have actually a, an experiment which contra contradicted the theory. So that's what, that was my chance to understand that. And I, I, I found out that if you did the calculation in a different way that you got the right answer. This was in the year 1957 when the Russians sent up the first satellite, which they call Sputnik, which means companion, because it was a companion for the Earth. So this Sputnik was up there in space, and it was making everybody nervous, because if the Russians could send satellites into space, they could also throw missiles at us, and we at that time didn't have any missiles which we could throw at them. So it was a, a scary moment, and so it was a, a moment when you could get money very easily for crazy projects. And uh, so my friend Ted Taylor, who was a, a young physicist, actually younger than me, uh, he had this idea of building a spaceship with nuclear bombs, which sounds crazy, and in a certain way it is crazy, but uh, it could have actually, it could have worked. And uh, so I thought that would be exciting to do. I, I had never done anything like that. I'd been always just a mathematician and w working on paper. But uh, so that gave me a chance to do something real. So I moved to San Diego in California and uh, joined a company called General Atomic, which is still there. And... Uh, went to work on the spaceship. And it looked as though we might even get the green light actually to go ahead and build it. But in the end, of course, we didn't. The fatal flaw of that whole scheme is that it spreads radioactivity all around. You're exploding bombs in big numbers. So you really do make a tremendous mess. And uh, so in the end, common sense prevailed. and. and they decided to go ahead with ordinary rockets, not with nuclear bombs. But we had a great time. We studied the theory of this and the engineering. We had a lot of good engineers. And we actually did little tests of chemical explosives, building little model plane, little model spacecraft which would go pop, 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 just up in the sky and come down again. And uh, just to show that we knew how to do it. So we had every Saturday morning, we, we didn't get paid for that, but um, every Saturday morning we'd go and fly our little models. The rest of the week we'd do the serious stuff. So I spent a year and a half there and the project actually lasted for seven years. But by the end of the first year, it was pretty clear that it wasn't going to fly. It, it, if, if it had been given the green light, we could have gone to Mars in about five years. I mean, the, the thing started in 58, and we planned to have a Mars mission already after, within five years. 
and we'd be scooting all around the solar system. I mean, it was a very, very high-performance ship, far better than anything we have today, and it would have easily gone to Mars and back and to Jupiter and the satellites of Saturn and all the interesting places in the solar system. We could have gone scooting around, and of course we intended to go ourselves. This was a big ship and it was with a crew. We imagined we would have a crew of about 40 people, so it was on the grand scale. And uh, it would have been comparatively cheap because it, it was built like a submarine, not like an airplane. It was uh, heavy engineering and, and so a lot cheaper than aerospace. Well, the joke is, of course, that we do such marvelous missions now with small payloads. When we worked on Orion, we were talking about a thousand tons of payload just for one ship. And so we thought of ourselves sort of like, like the Darwin on the Beagle going out for five years and with all our provisions and having to take along a squash court so, so that you could stay fit and, and we could take along almost anything we wanted. And of course nowadays the whole way of operating in space is so totally different. Now you measure the payload in pounds, not in tons. And uh, so you, we have our, our ship, which is now orbiting around Saturn called Cassini, which of course doesn't have people on board. It has wonderful instruments on board. And that uh, the, the, the total payload of that thing is a, a few thousand pounds. And it's doing far more exploring than we could have done. So if we had a thousand tons of payload today, we wouldn't know what to do with it. Oh, yes, I think so. But of course, uh, my guess is no better than anybody else's. But uh, technically, it could be done. Of course, it's much too expensive just for the next hundred years or maybe the next thousand years. But we have lots and lots of time. So I would imagine that we will be scooting around on a much grander scale. But, but uh, it could, on the other hand, we could decide we're not interested, so let's, let's not do it. And that remains to be seen. Well, of course, nobody knows. That's why it's interesting. I mean, that it, it, it's completely unknown whether the, these, these creatures exist or what they look like or where they are. So we're free to, to search in all sorts of ways. And what is delightful about it is that our, it, 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 is, it is very cheap, actually. The amounts of money that uh, have to be spent are quite small and they don't increase with time because our processing of data is all the time getting cheaper and cheaper. It's essentially a matter of computers which are getting more powerful every year but are not increasing in cost. So it means that we're getting better and better at it, but with more or less constant expenditure. And so it, it makes a lot of sense just to go on. There's always a chance next year we find something and we don't have, it's not, it's, it, as the public is sort of misled to, into thinking this is a, a grand and expensive project. Actually, it's not. I don't think there's any difference. I mean, what, the, the, uh, the time that physicists deal with is essentially the same as ordinary time, except that physicists think of, of, of microseconds or picoseconds instead of just seconds. That means millionths of a second or tri trillionths of a second. So they can act, uh, physicists can think of very short intervals of time. But that doesn't really make much difference to ordinary life. I think much, I mean, much more b b big changes in our thinking are, are coming along with the biology rather than with physics. When biology advances, then we think differently about ourselves. And that really does make a difference. I mean, for example, at the moment, the, most rapid movement in biology is neurology. We're learning how to study our brains 
and to, to take moving pictures of, of brains with magnetic fields so you can actually see things going on in our own heads when we're thinking. And that's going to change the way we think about ourselves, I think, in a much more fundamental way. Well, I can't say I talk about it in depth, but uh, it's true that quantum mechanics makes atoms unpredictable. I mean, the, 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 that was the big surprise, that when you understand atoms, it turns out you absolutely cannot predict what they're going to do. That the, the, the laws are, are just don't, don't, don't allow exact predictions. It's, there's a, 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 cert, a certain kind of freedom that atoms have to jump around, and they, they seem to choose entirely on their own without any input from the outside. So in a certain sense, atoms have free will. So that's, uh, to my mind at least, it's uh, probably connected with the fact that we have free will we have at least a strong feeling when we decide to move a hand up and down that we're free to do it or not. And uh, so it could be that we are actually using the freedom that quantum mechanics allows. So the brain is a kind of an amplifier which takes, takes the freedom of movement of atoms and translates it into freedom of movement of our whole body but that's at least my feeling about it, and we don't understand it in detail, but it looks as though there is a connection. Well, the human mind is just a sort of a, <laughs> a clever device for, for using this freedom in order to achieve some kind of a purpose. And... Uh, and, and of course, any, animals in general do that. And humans have reached the point of being aware of what they're doing. No, I'm sorry I can't. I mean, I was here in Princeton when Einstein was still alive, but I never spoke a word to him. And, and in fact, he, he moved in his own circle of friends. And he didn't have anything much to do with the young people here at the Institute. So we, we never actually contacted, he never came to our talks or to our meetings, and uh, which was a shame, but uh, that's, uh, that, that's the truth. Well, I suppose Well, most of what people believe about him is true, I would say. I mean, that he was a uh, totally exceptional person in all sorts of ways. His science was exceptional. His, his, his humor was exceptional. His uh, uh, ability to say, uh, just 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 to, to to answer questions in a witty way with, so that he got into headlines in the newspapers he had a, just this wonderful gift of talking to the public and in addition of course he had a turbulent family life and he was a in many ways a, a selfish and unpleasant character but he, on the other hand he was wonderful with children and so on i mean there were all sorts of he had wonderful qualities and those things, I think, the public rightly appreciated. And well, of course, the, the one I wrote about most, or the one I enjoyed most, was Richard Feynman. He was, a, 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 when I knew him best, he was quite young. So he and I were about five years apart. So he was a young professor, I was a student. And he took me for a ride across the country from here to Albuquerque in a rickety old car, and we had a great time. So I mean, he was a wonderful person to be around. In addition, he was a genius, and, and so he was doing the physics 
that actually made me famous. I, I, he, he had the ideas and then I translated them into mathematics. So we worked together in that sense. So he had always, he, he, he did the real work and I tied it up afterwards. But anyway, it was a great thing to be with him and I enjoyed him enormously. And in addition, because he was a great joker, he, 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 he was a clown. He, he loved to, to play the fool and he, 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 he was famous for picking locks. He could, he could open a safe and he did that quite a lot just in order to shock people and and he told stories about himself, most of which were true. Well, of course, almost everything has changed. So that book was written at an unfortunate time. It was just about two years before the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the world changed totally. And I'd never ever thought that would happen. But very few people I know ever did imagine the Soviet Union could just peacefully disappear the way it did. And of course, so the, the way the world has changed since then, of course, is that all the troubles are now on a small scale comparatively, but they're totally different. And, and uh, so you have wars like the war in Vietnam, the war, like the war, the war in Iraq and, and the war in Afghanistan, where small weapons, of course, are doing all the harm. And these are le lethal weapons, particularly landmines and, and uh, ex explosive devices in the ground and the uh, little handheld rockets and machine guns. and So it's all small arms. Uh, it's, it's not, nobody's using nuclear weapons. And so the, the whole problem of war and peace has changed totally. And uh, we're not able to cope with it very well. And unfortunately, the sort of old way of thinking still prevails in, in large parts of the world. We haven't adjusted to the changes. So it was an unfortunate time to write that book. And if I wrote it now, it would be very different. And it's, um, I mean, everything the book says about nuclear weapons, I think is still true. But of course, what it doesn't do is to talk about the, all these small and much more important weapons that we have now. It's amusing that the company I worked for when I worked on the Orion, 50 years ago when I worked on the spaceship, the company is called General Atomic. And now they're doing extremely well because what they've changed over now is to building predators. The predator is the unmanned airplane that is now being used all the time in Iraq and Afghanistan and in Pakistan, partly just for spying on the what's, for, for taking pictures of what's going on on the ground. But in, in addition, it's also being used for killing people on the ground. So it's become now a very important part of the war. And we never imagined that when we worked there. Well, he should be doing much more. I mean, this is, I, 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 I like Obama and I like what he's doing, but this is not imp at all impressive. George Bush Sr. did far more. I mean, George Bush Sr. got rid of more than half of our nuclear weapons just like that. He, he was the one who really got rid of nuclear weapons on a big scale. But George Bush Sr. was careful because he was a Republican, he did it very quietly. He didn't want to have his name associated with that. 
and uh, but he got it done. And of course, with Obama, it's sort of the opposite, that he would like to get the credit for it, but he's not really doing it. And so um, it, it's, um, I think he should be doing far more, and I hope he will. But he's in a much more difficult position. It helps to be a right-wing Republican if you want to disarm. Well, that's a big subject, of course, and I mean, I don't like the word catastrophe. I don't think there's any catastrophe there, but certainly the climate is changing, and that's important. It's always been changing. We've, we've ne there's never been a time when the climate stayed put for any length of time, and and uh, so I'm. I would say the uh, all the evidence we have is that we're having some effect on the climate. It's not clear whether it's good or bad. It's not clear whether it's going to become a catastrophe or not. And as far as I'm concerned, it's very foolish to do anything spectacular. To, to What we should be doing is dealing with the problems in detail. I mean, the first thing is we should build dikes around New Orleans and I mean, there's, there are simple practical things we can do which really would help, and uh, like building dikes around c cities which are exposed to hurricanes or tsunamis. And, and uh, so th these kind of practical measures could be enormously helpful. I mean, we've seen just in the last f few months, we've seen t two big earthquakes one in Haiti and one in Chile, and what we've seen is that the earthquake in Chile was much larger, but the damage actually was smaller. The reason being that Chileans had taken more trouble to build buildings that would resist earthquakes. And so you can act, it actually helps enormously to strengthen your buildings. Of course, the, I mean, Chile has the advantage of being a a richer country to start with, but it's a dr dr dramatic proof of what you can do. You can actually take a natural catastrophe and reduce the damage by a factor of a hundred or so just by quite simple measures, just having good building codes. And the same is true of climate, that uh, there are all sorts of things we can do in a practical way it's not only we don't ha only have to worry about warming, we also have to worry about cooling, and it could very well be the climate gets colder. Nobody knows. And there are many things we should be doing to prepare for that, and, and uh, which are not all that expensive. But w what I think is ab absurd, what, what I disagree with very strongly, is the idea that climate is predictable, that we can... T t do things a hundred years in advance, knowing what's going to happen. That's just not that's just not the way it is. Oh, I I'm, I I doesn't disturb me at all. That the uh, I'm I'm always believe in talking to my op opponents and make, staying friends. I mean, you know it. it so the people I disagree with most strongly, I'm actually quite friendly with, and, and there's no, the, the, it doesn't make, it doesn't, it doesn't disturb me if they disagree with me. Well, I don't know. It changes from week to week. I mean, I, what I've noticed is there's been a strong increase in skepticism, and just in the last couple of weeks, and. Uh, I suppose it has something to do with all these snowstorms we've been having. I, I don't know, but um, certainly I've seen uh, the politicians becoming much more skeptical just recently. And that, of course, I welcome. That, that I think that, that that's actually means they're rec recognizing the way things are. Well, there are all sorts of ways. There was a, 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 a couple of farmers in Minnesota I was just reading about who 
decided to change from feedlots to grass because they are raising beef. That these are farmers who are just uh, raising cows for beef and a certain amount of milk as well. And they decided to switch from feedlots, which is, of course, the, the fashionable way of raising cows. You keep them on a very crowded feedlot and feed them on corn. So you're growing corn to feed to the animals. Instead of that, you put them out to grass, but you manage the grass in a clever way with moving fences around. So they actually eat the grass much more evenly. It turns out this pays, and, and uh, it, it's, uh, they're doing extremely well. Just going back from feedlots to grass, and it has a big effect on the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere if, if, in proportion to the area that they're using. So it means that if the whole of the Middle West would do this, it would make a very substantial difference to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And, and so that kind of, that's the sort of practical thing you can do, just sort of managing the land more intelligently. And these, it's, it's rather like building dikes around New Orleans. I mean, it's, it's, it's not all that spectacular, but it actually works. And so changing f from feedlots to grass, I think it's sort of, it's not, it doesn't solve the whole problem but it solves a certain chunk of the problem. And there are other things you can do. Just doing less plowing makes a huge difference. Plowing is one of the main causes of carbon going into the atmosphere. As you, you expose the soil to the atmosphere, it means the carbon gets oxidized and becomes carbon dioxide and floats off into the atmosphere. So if you can farm without plowing, it actually helps. And it uh, doesn't matter how much coal and oil you're burning, it still helps. No, I remember uh, so Jocelyn Bell, the, the uh, lady who discovered pulsars, never got the Nobel Prize. And she was here talking to, to, to the students uh, just a couple of years ago, because she's now a very distinguished scientist. And this all, she discovered pulsars about 40 years ago. And, and uh, anyway, the students were asking her, are you sorry you didn't get the Nobel Prize? And she said, oh, no, I've been all my life, I've just been famous for not having the Nobel Prize. And <laughs> that was actually much better. And so I, I think she's right. I mean, you know, it's much better if people ask, why didn't you get the prize? It's much better than if they're asking, why did you get it? Oh, I would say bringing up six kids and who are all productive citizens. And <laughs>